This week on the Computer Chronicles, cyber art. We'll show you some virtual art museums on the net. We'll show you how to create your own works of art with the latest version of CorelDRAW. And you can even get into the world of 3D design with this new program called Detailer. And if you're into animation, we'll show you how to do that on your PC with a new program called 3D Studio Max. Plus, a visit to a digital art show and some performance art that blends people and computers. All this plus Giles Online, this week's computer news, my pick of the week, coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. Additional funding from PC Connection and Mac Connection, the catalog and online superstore with over 10,000 PC and Mac products, award-winning service, toll-free technical support, and overnight delivery, www.pcconnection.com. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Well, what would a Leonardo da Vinci or a Michelangelo think if they could just see today's computer technologies that's being used in the world of art? It's hard to imagine. Computers and the Internet have had an immense effect on art, artists, and art appreciation. And I guess, Linda, that's the area I want to talk to you about. You run an art gallery, a real one and a virtual one online. There is so much stuff on the net now dealing with art in which we can visit galleries and museums. Where do you begin? I think the best place to start with the search engine, such as Yahoo. And Yahoo I like using because it basically has everything indexed. So look for museums, look for galleries, and go, huh? Yeah. All right, now when it comes to museums, uh, what, what's the best one you think to look at I think here? the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco is the best one. And the reason it's the best one, it has the most stuff online. It's got 125,000 pieces of art in the museum, and 60,000 of them are online. So about half its collection has been scanned in and put yeah. on their online museum. Yeah. And you have to realize, in comparison, a regular gallery will only have maybe 30 images online. So, so it's immense, really. It's really huge. Now, what's cool with this museum is you can actually do an unusual kind of search, which is an image search as opposed to a text search. How does that work? It basically goes in and searches um, images by uh, color, textures. By artistic yes, qualities by rather color. than words. Rather than know? keywords. All right, so what are we looking at now? Japanese print collection? Yes, we've done pulled up the Japanese print collection, and we pulled up eight random images. Okay, and what so we're going to do is we're going to click on one of these and go and search for, for example, this one. Okay, so if I like that one over there, I'd like to see other prints in the collection that are similar to that from a color point of view. Yes, and if we click on that, it will bring up images that are basically in the same color tones. And we so see that's amazing. They're, they're very similar there. All right, now there are tons of galleries on here, too, and you, you have your gallery online, don't you? Yes. Can we take a quick look at that? Sure. Now, is this all the stuff you would have in your gallery, or just some of it? Um, this, at the moment, we've got about a third of our stuff uh -huh. on, on here. And what we do is, first of all, we have a little gallery where we have thumbnail sketches, and you can actually then go to larger images. Okay, so could I click on one of those if I really liked one of those to see a full screen version of that? And it will bring up... Um, other ones they have, mm -hmm. and we'll actually even pull up a, a full screen version. And then I could sort of decide whether I want to come visit the real gallery and look at those paintings. For Have you sold any through your virtual gallery? Um, we haven't sold any online, but we've had people have seen us first online and came in and bought art, so it works for me. <laughs> All right, now another thing that's really interesting is Sotheby's. You can actually go into Sotheby's auction and sort of pretend you're bidding for, for art. Is that true? Yeah, they have an interactive site where you go in and you can pretend you're part of an art, art auction and learn how to participate in an art auction and then learn after how your bid compared to the real art So let's auction. take a look at this. So this is what, this auction adventures? Yes. So it's a kind of simulated art auction that's not real. I'm it's not, not real, but it's simulated. But I can learn the how you do this kind of thing. Yes, yeah, so it takes all the mystery out of it. Finally, there's, there's a site I want you to show me where there's actual computer generated art, guys who are using computers to create art. Could you quickly get that up? Um, yes, this is basically at the SciTech site, which, mm -hmm. um, which has a digital gallery. And what they do is iris prints. Iris prints are prints that are scanned into the computer and printed. And it's the best quality prints you can buy today. And they're really computer generated prints that you would uh, yes. display in a museum. Now, Yuri Do Dotan here creates his art on a silicon graphics computer mm. and renders all the images and then prints it. So there's a ton of stuff online if you're interested in just looking at art. There is. Thanks a lot, Linda. Well, you can use computers and the net to look at traditional art, as we saw. But as we also saw, some artists are using computers and technology to create and define totally new forms of art. We checked out some examples at the Lim Gallery in San Francisco. The Lim Art Gallery in San Francisco's Multimedia Gulch 
was the site of a show called Dig It, Art from the Gulch. The gallery's walls were bare, but the floors were covered with computers. Some exhibits were passive, some interactive, and a few had very little to do with computers. I didn't want to just have a um, screen on a table. I really wanted to get away from that. So it turned out to be this, and I wanted to collaborate with um, artists, a painter and a sculptor, because I wanted to make a statement about old-time farming with old-time imagery, the hay, the tractor seat, the lettering, the word, um, and new technology with biotechnology being projected on the screen. Once past the sculptures and through the grain sack curtains, visitors were faced with a screen full of facts about biotechnology, accompanied by the sound of crows. Most of the artists at Dig It choose to keep their art purely digital. There was an interactive work called Antibiotics, a series of two parallel 30-second video clips taken every hour of the day for a week. A piece entitled Cardinal Directions took the passive approach, preferring to experiment with a new visual context using words and animation. In Turboville, visitors navigated through a fictional world using a mouse. The speed and direction of travel were controlled by the amount of mouse movement. Since each person moved the mouse differently, each experience was unique. The uncertain status of digital art amongst museums and galleries did not seem to dampen the spirits of the artists from the gulch. It's pretty obvious if you look at the work that is being created, it's all the mediums are so new that there's no one way to approach it, there's no standard to it. If you think of it as say digital art, do you think of it as just art as art? Do you think of it as digital as digital? I mean, there's no real true definition of it, and that's what makes it really exciting. That's why I'm doing it. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Tom Van Horn. When it comes to using the computer to create works of art, there have been some incredible advances over the past few years in the software. One example is the newest version of a classic. That's CorelDRAW, and we're up to version 7 right now, right. Leah. I want, this is a hard task to show CorelDRAW <laughs> in a couple of minutes, I know, but focus on the stuff that's new in version 7. Okay. Well, the key to CorelDRAW 7 is really productivity. We've done a lot of work with speeding up the application, redraw, file open, etc. But we've also worked on the interface and making it more interactive for the user. Like what? Well, for example, let's draw a polygon on screen here, and we can just interactively change the shape of that polygon. Notice that I have something at the top called the property bar, and this reflects all the properties of the object that I'm working on. So very quickly I can change the number of sides. And the right percent. property bar is up there depending on what tool I'm using. That's right. You never have to search for functions. Everything's presented to you right there on the property bar. Okay. We can change colors of the polygon just by clicking on our color palette, or I can click and drag and drag that color of the fill or the outline right onto mm -hmm. the object. Again, interactivity. Yeah. Some other things that we can do, we have three new interactive tools, one for filling, one for transparency, and one for blending. Let's take a look at the fill tool. Click and drag right on the object and I can create a fountain fill. By dragging other colors onto that particular line, I can create a multi-step fountain fill. So when you say interactive, these are really real-time tools in which you do it and you see the results right there. You exactly. don't have to do it and then wait to look at it exactly. later. Exactly. For example, we have traditional dialogues where you can yeah. set up your fountain fills, but you never know exactly how exactly. that's going to look on your object. You can change the different kinds of fountain fills right on the property bar, or you can go to our scrapbook where we have pre-made fountain fills or other kinds of fills and drag and drop those mm -hmm. directly onto the object. This is a conical fill. And notice that, again, the importance of the interactivity here is that I can align really those see the perfectly results of what with you're the doing points. Right away, yeah. Yeah. So that is the benefit of, of working in CorelDRAW 7. Now, CorelDRAW has traditionally been a vector program, mm -hmm. but we have done a lot of work with integrating bitmaps into CorelDRAW as well. In fact, we have a dedicated menu specifically for bitmaps, and you can apply uh, bitmap effects just as you would in Corel Photo Paint. We also have improved things like power clipping, which is our way of pasting an image inside a piece of text or another image. So I can merge the text and the piece of art there? For example, yeah, let's make this uh, Futura a nice fat font. We have a thousand different fonts we can choose from mm -hmm. there. I'm just going to click and drag that image right inside my text. Mm. Now, we've done some other work with bitmaps as well. 
I'll bring that on here. And just to show off one of our other really cool tools, which is interactive transparency, I'm going to use these bitmaps as an example. Right now, obviously, I'm blocking that image behind, mm -hmm. but if I add interactive transparency to that image, I can now see through mm -hmm. it. And this is the kind of thing you see on travel brochures, right. etc. And that is fast, as you say. And the third interactive tool we have is for blending. I just click and drag between two objects, and I can easily mm. blend them together. Now I'm just going to take off the outline on that object, maybe make that back one just a little smaller. And I'm just going oh, to cool. quickly draw a line here. And again, using my interactive blend tool, I'm just going to drag that blend onto the line, interactively fit it to the line, and then just drag this along the line to create a new effect. That's really cool. All right, we're looking at sort of commercially businessy kind of art. I know you can do some really creative stuff with Corel Draw too. Show us an example of an image done with Corel. Well, let me show you an amazing image. This won our design contest a few years ago, and this is called the Huntress. Um, this is all created from very simple objects, fountain fills, ellipses, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But you can see the incredible art that you can create in Corel Draw. Leah, thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. One of the great advances in art over the centuries was the discovery of perspective and dimensionality. Well, now with computers, you can actually create 3D art objects. And one of the best new tools for doing that is a program called Detailer from Fractal Design. And that's your baby. You wrote this, Mark. That's right. What's a special problem in working on a 3D surface as opposed to a flat surface? Well, when you're working on a 3D surface, uh, what you want to be able to do is to look at the 3D object and sort of paint directly on it. Uh, actually knowing, noting the registration sort of between mm -hmm. the texture map and the object. And when you're working in 3D programs, that actually makes it very difficult because often you have to go to a 2D program and uh, detail your map, then bring it back and into 3D. And lay it over on the 3D surface. Right. And now what you can do with Detailer is work directly right on the 3D object in the first place. Yeah, we sort of combine the two by creating a program All here. Right, show us how you do that then. Okay. So here's an example of a 3D object that we've modeled here. We have five different kinds of maps that can be mapped onto the object. The texture map shows your color. Mm -hmm. The bump map shows sort of the 3D uh, surface uh, detail. The highlight mass says which parts are um, shiny and which mm -hmm. ones aren't. The reflection mass says which parts are actually reflective and which ones aren't. And the glow map is useful for actually putting lights and like LEDs onto a spaceship. Okay. And flying it. All right, so let's go through some of these tools and show us how, how you would use them. Okay, well, let's first look at the texture map. Uh, what If I wanted to, for instance, put a checkerboard pattern on the top here, then I could literally do that. If I wanted to uh, work with um, a brush such as an airbrush right on the surface of it, I literally could paint right on it. And of course, Detailer comes with all of the tools of our famous painter product, so we can literally uh, do even sort of natural media mm -hmm. painting directly on it. Uh, naturally, with multiple levels of undo, yeah. it even makes it simpler uh, to, if you make mistakes to go back where you were before. The bump map is something that actually allows you to paint literally onto the surface of the object with bumps. So for instance, when I paint into here, you'll notice, um, and here we would have to use a uh, color like black, you'll notice that literally it's creating ridges onto the surface of the yeah. object and you're seeing little highlights with it. Uh, with highlight and reflection, that literally gives you the ability to specify which areas are shiny, like this area here, and which areas are matte, like this area here. So mm -hmm. here we have sort of terracotta, and here we have something which was literally glazed and fired, sort of. Mm. Uh, that's what we're trying to simulate. Right. So um, the cool thing is that with reflection in uh, detail, you literally get the ability to create uh, objects which are mm. like chrome. So in this case here, we actually have environment maps which you can import or create your own uh, maps directly onto the object. Can you show us, can you actually rotate that object and, and see it from different angles? In oh yeah, there? if you need to be able to paint on the other side of the object, you can turn it around mm -hmm. and you can see, notice the, this part here that we're painting on the bump map right. is now rotated around, so now we're painting a different area. Um, literally, uh, also, you have the ability to adjust your lighting, which mm -hmm. is really very useful. For instance, this light here, which is creating a shine down here, I've moved over a different side, but now I've created a dark area of my object. So I can actually take my light tool and click on the object, and it will create a light with a highlight in that mm -hmm. spot. So it's easier to use, really, than ever before. Combine sort of the natural mix between 2D painting and 3D sort of detailing object yeah. texture maps. All right, you're showing us Detailer on a, on a Mac here. Does it work on Windows also? Yes, it works on Windows, NT, and 95, mm -hmm. and it supports file formats, uh, model formats from 3D Studio, Raydream Designer, 
uh, Wavefront OBJ, DXF, uh, QuickDraw 3D, and of course all the image file formats yeah. literally that you could ask for. Great, Mark, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Stuart. Well, as we saw earlier, some artists are using computers to create new forms of art, but the use of computer technology has gone far beyond art itself and into the broader arena of performance art in which computers are becoming an integral part of artistic expression in a variety of forms. A fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees. Some of it is real. Some of it seems real, but floats in front of your eyes like a drifting cloud. Actors appear and disappear inside painted 3D landscapes by 18th century poet William Blake. Fusing reality and virtual imagery, 2020 Blake is the latest creation from the George Coates Performance Works, an avant-garde theater company in San Francisco. The magical setting that audiences see on and over the stage originates in a back room crowded with slide trays, film projectors, and two Silicon Graphics Onyx computers. What we did with this show was took uh, William Blake's paintings and uh, with a Macintosh and Photoshop and uh, Strata Blitz, uh, various other software, uh, separated out the elements of the paintings and made them into scenes that the actors could walk around in. 2020 Blake is based on William Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell, a poetic work filled with Blake's visions of spirits, angels, and the souls of the deceased. Over a dozen slide and film projectors illuminate an immense screen on stage with multiple layers of Blake's paintings. Computers provide the flames, birds, and other effects. Seen through 3D glasses, actors appear to move through the imagery. For the director, mixing a traditional craft with new technology calls for a careful balance of the two. Early on, the technology is ruling in the first performances. As we're experimenting with these new tools, we ourselves are dazzled by what can happen. And maybe we go too far in the direction of saying, oh, how many bells and whistles can we get to go off here? What can it do? What can it do? Later, as we mature and begin to realize where the technology is helpful and where it isn't, we start to become a little bit more selective about how we use these tools. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Tom Van Horn. The ultimate artistic challenge for a computer is 3D animation, characters and objects which move. One of the best tools we found for doing this is the new 3D Studio Max program from Kinetics. And Philip, 3D animation and 2D animation are totally different, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. Here's an example of 2D animation where the art, it's up to the artist to define every single cell, every single frame of the animation. It's all pasted together. This was done with Animator Studio from Kinetics. Now, how is 3D animation different then? Well, the artist simply models the object, animates it, and all the lighting characteristics and shadows and everything are taken care of for him within the program. That is so much more complex that you say it's really easier with the kind of software you have to deal with now. Right, that's with uh, 3D Studio Max. Yeah. It does make it a lot easier nowadays. All right, let's go through that process. Let's begin with just an object and show us how you would start the process of animating an object. Okay. Real quickly, we'll start and create uh, something very common, uh, say a teapot. With that teapot then, to set keyframes in animation, we simply click on the animate button, and then every single point we do from that on point on is a keyframe. So you're making moves and really recording what you're doing exactly. so you can play back that animation? Those are all keyframes, and then when it gets animated, the computer figures okay. out all the interpolation in between. All right, that's kind of easy in a way, moving the thing. Now, how about actually distorting it and, and giving it sort of qualities? Well, that's a good question. Here we're going with uh, deformations. For example, we can taper the object very quickly. Mm -hmm and perhaps come to, the end of the, come to the end of the animation and maybe bend it, bend it way over to give it some character. And again, same idea. You're saying do this and remember it and do it in sequence again. Right. So now it's bending, twisting, and bending over all the way over in time, something that before would take much, much longer. And you really just did this in real time, right? Absolutely. All right, let's go to the next uh, level of complexity, and that's using a character in which you're dealing with bone structure and movement in which we know what it ought to look like. Okay. Yeah, characters are one of the most difficult things to animate. And to help people along and artists with that, we created a product called Character Studio. 
which is a plugin application for 3D Studio Max. And here, it's a revolutionary method of working with footprints to define the actual animation. So here we lay down the footprints and the character adheres to them afterwards. So again, the sort of physiology is built into the software. It knows what's the right kind of move. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying, go to these different footsteps and right. it will naturally move from place to place. So yeah, footprints are something that everybody can relate to. Mm. And once you're working with it, it's completely interactive. So you really put a lot of the animation inside the software, sort of inside the intelligence that I don't have to think about as the artist. Well, we prefer to think about it as we're giving the artist time to make his animations all the better. Yeah. Okay, now you have an example of dolphin swimming, which is really incredible. Show us a little bit of how you created that, and then I want to see the finished product. Sure. Here we go. Here we have some uh, dolphin just swimming along a spline path, animating here in the viewport. And we can take a look at how we manipulate that dolphin by taking a look at the spline and manipulating the key spline point there. And as we do that, the dolphin will just keep up with it. So again, you created a character, you create a path for the character, mm -hmm. and the character knows how to bend and adjust to the path. It's one of many ways you can yeah. animate. All right, and show us what this all looks like in the end, because it's really okay. quite incredible. Here you go. Here we have a school of those dolphins doing exactly the same thing we just showed, swimming below the water and catching all the reflections and everything that are coming through the water, filtering down. And that is so realistic. Finally, you did something which is unbelievable with F-16s, which looks like a piece of film. But again, this was modeled again in 3D Studio Max, if you can pull that one up. Sure. Um, this, is more, this is an example of something you might see on film or uh, in video or something uh -huh. like that. Here's a pair of F-16s that were modeled in 3D Studio Max, and they're launching their missiles right at the end there. Now, this is just a preview render. You don't get mm -hmm. to see it. To see the real thing, you have to use the production renderer, and then it looks something like this where the F-16s are coming down, wow. launching their missiles, and we can even see what they're actually hitting over That's here. That's amazing. Thank you very much, Philip. All right, well, we've already seen some examples of art on the Internet in forms of virtual museums and art galleries. There is a lot more on the web that can help you create or enjoy art. Here's our webmaster, Giles Bateman, with some suggested sites. Thanks, Stuart. Yes, museums and galleries online are cool, but I think what also is great is the art community on the net. And the best place, I think, to learn about that to start off is a sort of cyber zine called Why Not Sneeze. If you come here, there's a lot of good information, but if you look in the theory section, you'll find an article called Home is Where the Art Is, an Introductory Guide to Art on the Internet. There's a good uh, sort of essay here, and as you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see there are links to some of the different sites they talk about. Great starting place. Now, if you are not very confident talking about the different types of uh, art that there are just in the real world, online or not, come to Art Deal. It's another e-zine, if you will, but they have a cool section in their educational and critical uh, services area called What's the Deal? Now, it used to be called Stu Stupid About Art. I'm glad they changed the title. What's the Deal uh, kind of teaches you how to talk about and understand what's happening in the different areas of art, abstract painting, minimalism, postmodernism. These are good layman's terms introductions to these different areas of art. Last but not least, I recommend checking out the Capella Sistina, as you know, the Sistine Chapel, uh, the uh, beautiful chapel painted by Michelangelo, Botticelli, uh, Ghirlandaio, the different uh, painters. Here, if you come to this website, you will find images from all over the entire uh, the entire chapel. So, what, for instance, I'll go into scenes from the Genesis here. These are some of Michelangelo's paintings. And you can scroll down and uh, actually click on different pictures to get full-blown JPEGs of the different uh, things. This is pre-restoration, but what you can do is print them out like I do. Uh, here I've got some here that printed out, and you can take them up and paper your own ceiling. Thanks, Giles. Time now for our weekly summary of the latest internet and computer news. Here's this week's Random Access Report with Lori Anderson. In the Random Access file this week, Microsoft is expanding its reach once again. They've purchased Web TV Networks, a company that sells systems to allow people to surf the internet over their TVs. We expect uh, Web TV to allow uh, a great user experience to be provided for both internet-based uh, consumer electronics like they have today and also the marriage of that with our Windows CE and Internet Explorer technology in order to have a compatible experience for digital television between the personal computer with the new broadcast architecture for Windows and the, uh, the digital TVs of the future. Microsoft also announced that the next release of Windows will enable PCs to receive video and digital data from broadcast sources. 
Compaq introduced new technology for faster internet access called acceleration server technology. Compaq uses hardware and software to load web pages two to three times faster with your current modem and standard phone line. Apple Computer launched a new line of computers called the Power Macintosh 6500. The systems can run at speeds up to 300 megahertz, performing tasks up to twice as fast as the fastest Pentium MMX computer. USA Today reports that the Social Security Administration's Internet site could allow anyone to have access to your financial background. The site recently added a feature to make it easier for individuals to look up their own records, but anyone who has your Social Security number may abuse the system and obtain your private information. A spokesman for the administration says the dangers are minimal. That's it for this week's news. Back to you, Stuart. Now for my pick of the week. It seems there is a never-ending quest for the ultimate human-computer interface. We have tried keyboards, mice, touchscreens, voice, but we're still looking for a simple, natural system that works. Well, what did we do before computers? We used a pen or a pencil. And that is what the folks at Communication Intelligence Corporation decided was the best solution. Their newest approach to pen input is this tidy little writing pad. It's called the Manta Handwriter. It lets you use your pen as a pointing device rather than a mouse. That usually means very fast control of Windows functions. The Handwriter also comes with handwriting recognition software, special quick editing functions, nice little add-ons like handwritten sticky pad notes. The Manta Handwriter is small enough to carry around with your laptop. It requires no external power. It's obviously great for creative work like paint programs, but my favorite application is doing crossword puzzles. To me, it's just not a crossword puzzle if you have to hit arrow keys and enter answers on a keyboard. But with the Handwriter and its bundled Lyric crossword program, you can do real crossword puzzles the old-fashioned way. Well, that's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with more of the best in hardware, software, and the Internet. If you need more information on anything you saw on today's show, just check out our website at PCTV.com. I'm Stuart Chaffe. We'll see you here next time. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. Additional funding from PC Connection and Mac Connection. The catalog and online superstore with over 10,000 PC and Mac products. Award-winning service, toll-free technical support, and overnight delivery. www.pcconnection.com.